Well, hello and welcome to the Herschel Building at Uni University of Newcastle for today's live Institute for Government event with Jamie Driscoll, Mayor of the North of Tyne. This event is part of our ongoing series of events on uh, devolution, levelling up and local leadership. And we've, we've been travelling around the country speaking with uh, various of the Metro mayors and, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Newcastle. Uh, so my name is Akash Pound. I'm very happy to be chairing this session on behalf of the Institute. So thank you to those of you joining in the room and hopefully the large audience watching online um, at the, as we speak. And of course, thanks Jamie very much for agreeing to take part. Um, oh, yeah, yeah uh, we, uh, we were just recollecting uh, beforehand, uh, we met once before at a conference um, just days before the UK went into lockdown. Um, I remember the, the, the atmosphere being very odd, everyone checking the news during the conference as the announcements got worse and worse. And uh, obviously for the next two years or so, we weren't really able to do um, events such as this. So it's great to be able to, to do this in person with you. Um, so a uh, brief introduction and then uh, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. So uh, well, Jamie, um, for those unaware, is very much a product of the Northeast of England, grew up down, uh, down the coast in, in Teesside, I believe, but then studied here at Northumbria University here in the city of Newcastle, that is to say, worked locally, ran a company, and then was elected uh, to serve on Newcastle City Council before being elected in May 2019 as the first ever mayor of the North of Tyne after the devolution deal was, was concluded a few months earlier with government. Um, and so in that capacity as Metro Mayor, Jamie's role is to chair the North of Tyne Combined Authority, uh, which comprises representatives from three constituent councils in the region, Newcastle, North Tyneside, and Northumberland, and along with representatives of business and voluntary sector, but not crucially the councils to the south of the River Tyne, and we'll, we'll come on to that in, in conversation, um, because negotiations, I believe, are well underway. Uh, we'll find out, hopefully, in a bit more detail what's going on between the government and local leaders here um, as part of the levelling up strategy about how the mayoral devolution deal in this region might be expanded, both geographically and in terms of the powers and funding that come with it. So with that going on, it's a great time, I think, to be holding this event. Um, and it's a pleasure to be doing so in partnership with the University of Newcastle, and in particular, uh, the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies and the Centre for Researching Cities, which are both uh, leading centres of expertise on uh, local economic development and urban governance, and I know have been influential over the years in, in shaping government thinking on the geography of devolution in, in, in various ways. So, so thanks very much to them, uh, Professor Danny McKinnon, who's in the room in particular, and his colleagues for helping to put this event on. Uh, thanks also to the JRSST, Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, for its support of our programme of work on devolution. Okay, so that's the introduction. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping points uh, before we get started properly. I've been asked to say to those in the room, if there were to be a fire alarm, uh, that will be a real fire alarm. So please exit in the usual calm and collected way through the nearest exits. Uh, there's no drill or anything like that. Um, I will be, for the next 20 to 30 minutes, putting questions to Jamie. We'll then have a good amount of time for Q&A. So people in the room, please obviously prepare your questions and we'll have a roving mic. People online, you should be able to submit questions um, via, there's an online uh, on-screen panel. Um, so please do start submitting those and I'll take some of those as well. Okay, I think that's all from me. So uh, yeah, Jamie, just to say again, great to, great to have you here with us. I'm really looking forward to it, actually, Akash. It's not often when I'm being interviewed that you get an hour to explain your position. Usually you get 30 seconds and that's it. Yeah, yeah, this is not just a soundbite uh, kind, of, kind of event. So yeah, hopefully we can get in mm. detail into some of these issues about the, the, the region and, and how devolution works here. 
Um, so uh, just to start off with then, I'd like to talk about levelling up. Mm. It's um, in the title, of course, of the event. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the what that means from a, from a north of Tyne and northeast perspective. So, I mean, it's not a, a revelation or anything to say that the this part of, of England, of the UK, um, is, and I think for a long time, has been, uh, you know, significantly below the UK average in terms of, for instance, uh, productivity. So this is uh, GVA per, per hour worked um, uh, across different parts of, of the UK. So you can see from this slide, the UK average um, on the blue line, there's London, of course, far ahead and north of Tyne below, um, below the average. And I think the, the, the gap has, has widened somewhat over, this is the 2010, 2019 period. So up to, to coronavirus. Um, that's of course a key indicator in terms of leveling up strategy and in terms of what I think devolution is designed to help Correct, although you might um, suggest other indicators we might use. Um, just one other slide I'll chuck up there before, before I bring you in, um, is on skills, which is one of the key areas where, where you and the, the combined authority have a role controlling the, the adult education budget. Um, and um, yeah, there again, there is, that, there is that gap disparity that the government says it wants to try and close through the levelling up strategy. Um, you can see that graphically there. So uh, my opening question, well, if you want to bring in other indicators, obviously, by, but feel free to do that. Um, but at least in, in terms of those kind of core economic metrics, mm. uh, what needs to happen to, to, to start to close those gaps? That's, that's the heart of it, isn't it? What levelling up is, once you get beyond the slogans. We've got to be very careful about which indicators we use. Sure. Because as far back as I can remember... We've had this debate over and over again. People have tried different things and it's never fixed the problem. So that slide that's showing, for example, the productivity difference between London and the Northeast, well, it's what we're actually measuring there. The cost of childcare in London is on average eight pounds sixty an hour. The cost of childcare in the Northeast, six pounds thirty-eight an hour. So it's thirty-five percent more productive by GVA for exactly the same skilled person do exactly the same job. Mm. And so what we're actually measuring there is a difference in essentially house prices and property prices, not simply are people any better at doing their job. Now, there are some things that also make a difference. A lot of things are headquartered outside of the Northeast. Mm. So talking to uh, a former very senior manager of, of Barclays was telling me that, that all my staff here are doing the work, but it all gets booked in London. So it skews the figures. The things we should actually be looking at are not just productivity. Yes, productivity is a massive driver, mm. um, but healthy life expectancy. Um, how many people are in debt? Issues uh, and measures around well-being. So what we've done in the north of Tyne is we've developed a well-being framework in conjunction with all of our partners, including Newcastle University. Mm. Uh, and that's what actually really matters. Because when people are, are, have a healthy life expectancy gap, sometimes of 13 years, depending where they live, but also within a region, it's massive as well. These are the differences. Um, and um, you may or may not have a slide about public investment, um, R&D investment uh, in regions like ours. These are the things that we need to shift to make a difference. Ultimately, it comes down to delivery though, because far too often, governments focus on outputs rather than outcomes. So it's uh, what can we measure we decide to make important, and that's the wrong way around. We need to decide how we measure what's important, and that shift, when we get that right, that will enable government to help people like me and my colleagues mm. and our local authorities really make a difference. Yeah, well, I mean, no, we don't have uh, data to hand on, on those, some of those other measures, but, I mean, yeah, that's of course the case there's there's any number of, of things one could measure and i mean to go back to the government strategy there is a, a long list of of, of metrics in, a, in an appendix um, and i think that's one of the criticisms of the agenda is maybe they're trying to cover almost uh, almost everything so it's a bit hard to know what the real priorities are so from your perspective in in this region if looking ahead to 2030 or, or, or even longer, levelling up were to have succeeded, what would that look like then? What would be the, the key changes that you would want to have seen to 
the north of Tyne or the wider northeast. What I would want to see is a transport system that was zero carbon. I would want to see everybody who wants a job have a job where they're not worried about paying their bills, and that's not the case now. Uh, there's a lot of people in work and yet still in poverty. Um, but ultimately, what I would want to see is kids going through school believing that their future is here. And they might have a choice. And if they want to go and live elsewhere, then you know, absolutely, it's a great uh, thing to be traveling the world and, and mixing in other places and, and contributing elsewhere. But far too often at the moment, kids going through school are, are thinking, well, what is my future? There's a lot of younger people at the moment worried, do I have a future, considering the, the urgency of the climate emergency? Mm. Um, and frequently, people reach a point where they, they hit the ceiling on their career locally and have to move. We fix that, that's when we know we've succeeded. Now, you can put metrics around that, uh, but really that's much more of a personal journey. And, and levelling up has got to be... I understand the need for, for government to have metrics and things like that, and, and I'm all for accountability. And actually, surprisingly, from, from someone from uh, my part of the political spectrum, I'm actually much stronger on accountability than, than, than central government is. Um, but it's really about the lived experience of people. What difference does it make to people? Do they have any hope for the future? Mm. Okay, and so to, to, to reach that, um, is, is, is the primary um, thing that you need to, 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 to do better as a region with you know, government's help and so on, is to bring that investment and to, to create the, the higher skilled, higher paid jobs, or, or is, is a wider set of issues? Yeah, that's right. Um, and there's two sides to that, Akash. There's, there's one is creating good, high quality jobs. Um, so we've done terrifically well, actually. Um, over the past couple of years, we've brought in seven major international firms mm. to set up bases here, in some cases having their UK headquarters here in our part of the world rather than uh, you know, perhaps in the southeast of London. Um, and many of those jobs are very highly paid, you know, some average salary of £54,000 a year, which is not bad for an average salary. Um, we've brought in a number of um, other big companies, but we're, we're leading the way in offshore wind. Mm. And we have in the northeast two, the two, gigafactories. Uh, so the battery technology that's going to decarbonise our transport is based here. Mm. And British it's British Vault. British Vault and Envision. Envision. Not technically in the north of time, but hopefully in that wider devolved area that we're, <laughs> we're going to get to. Um, so that's the sort of thing. Now, you've got the big investments. And now, of course, that's what the, the news headlines focus on. But what about all the SMEs? Um, if you go to somewhere like uh, Germany, and um, I do a lot of uh, collaborative work with people in Bavaria, mm. there they have a much stronger base of firms in that sort of 50 to 250 employee uh, zone with very strong links with our research, research institutes, mm. with good access to patient capital through their lander banks. Um, and that's a real moderator of their economy. So it's not the case that if a large employer through technological shifts or financial failures, goes bust, mm. the whole place doesn't collapse, which is what we did see in the northeast when we lost the shipyards and the steelworks and the coal mines. And there was nothing really there to absorb that economic shock. Economic shocks are a, a reality of life, but we can mitigate against them. Mm. Then you've got the, the SME, the, the micro and small businesses, and we work very well with them as well. So our recovery innovation deal, £10,000 chunks of investment, so a joiners, Cronin, um, they had a situation where they could only run one job at a time through their shop floor because one bit of wood looks very much like another. And if you send it out with the wrong job, the whole thing goes wrong. So just by investing in some software for £10,000, they were able to now run three or four jobs through the shop floor, mm. massively increase their productivity. That is a genuine increase in productivity, not, a, not a, an accounting um, artifact. They're now exporting to Japan. Mm. So... These are the things you could never, ever do that from central government. You can do that in a region. Mm. And that's so. something you're able to support through the funds you control in the combined right. authority. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting um, set of examples and, and, and issues there. So I wanted to come on to that, though, like what you're actually able to do, you as mm. mayor and the wider combined authority, of course. Um, because I think, you know, it's, 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 we've already touched upon this. In many ways the devolution deal uh, for this region is it's an incomplete settlement 
um, the geography of it isn't, yeah. um, you know, what, what, what it was originally supposed to do. The functions aren't as wide ranging as, as in most of the other Metro Mayor deals. Um, and yeah, and, 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 and the funding therefore is, 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 is less as well uh, for, for some of the key things. So I just wondered how it feels to you. So I just wanted to, to note, uh, I mean, back in 2019, um, you've probably seen this paper uh, yourself just before you elected our partners actually at, at Kurds. Uh, they published a report on the devolution deal and the, the role of, of mayor, and they described it, or at least they raised the question whether it would be an office without power uh, due to the, as I say, limited, relatively limited nature of the devolution deal. So is that how it's felt to you? Or <laughs> do you have what you need to, to try and achieve some of those, those uh, things you've been describing so far? Yeah, two different questions in there. What's it felt like? Um, and and um, do I have the powers I need? I would say that that office without power um, in an absolute sense, it's, it's clearly not true, and that's not what uh, Kurds were referring to. It's an office without the powers you need to fix the problem. Okay. Yes, it is. I would say that's the case of every mayor, by the way. Um, ours is underpowered compared to some of the under de other deals. No mayor at the moment has the powers they need to level up their region because they don't have the fiscal levers needed mm. to close the loop. Um, every time... We create, so we, I have a, a target as the combined authority for creating 10,000 jobs over 30 years. That's written in the deal. So pretty much exactly three years since I've been in office, we should by now have 1,000 jobs. It's actually 4,586. So we've smashed that out of the park by a factor of four and a half. Has our funding increased as a result of that? No, it hasn't. Every job we create, on average, sends 8,000 pounds a year to Treasury. So if we had a share of that, our success would be rewarded. Mm. Now, that would close the loop. Government in the, the, the white paper are very keen on accountability. Um, they tend to do it by league tables traditionally. And league tables are an aggregate of, of all sorts of different uh, problems. So they don't really represent, have you done what you could have done? They're often uh, a representation of, did you come from a strong position in the first place? Is there anything more accountable than me saying to Treasury, only pay me after I've delivered? That is literally perfect accountability. So that's the sort of powers we need. Payroll tax retention. Mm -hmm. Things like land value uplift. Um, when we put in new transport infrastructure, land values shoot up. Now, at the moment, we've done, led by Northumberland County Council, some terrific work in the region. where working with private landowners, they've said, yeah, you bring this in, we will give you a proportion of it. Mm. But that usually only works where it's greenfield or brownfield land. And uh, I'm sure everyone's of the opinion that a voluntary tax isn't a tax. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't tend to raise as much as if it's a genuine uh, legislatively backed tax. So if we put into position, if we, if we gave mayors the power to put a charge on property where they keep a share of the uplift, and other people get, the people who live there get a share of that, and they only pay it when that land comes to be sold or that property comes to be sold. We wouldn't be taking 15, 20 years to get new metro lines built. We could plan that now because we would have a revenue stream from all the good things we do. Mm. And this is not just big capital projects. Everybody is aware that there are so many people struggling with, for example, mental ill health, with just a little bit of support and mentoring to get themselves out of a, a bad place in their lives to go and get work. If we had the mechanisms whereby we generate the wealth and, and can prove to Treasury we have saved you this off the health service bill, off the criminal justice bill, and we could claim that back, I would happily borrow at risk to put these funds into place. Mm. Um, but the incentives aren't set up appropriately for... They're not, no. Although I have been talking to Treasury ministers and officials about this for a couple of years now, um, and I've, I'm not going to put them in an awkward position of saying who's agreed with me, but you'd be surprised at the number of people who have agreed, at some, often some quite high levels, who've said, yeah, you're kind of right, Jamie, we've just got to find a way to do it. And these are some of the things we're pursuing uh, in our devolution deal. Yeah, OK, really interesting. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the, 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 the funding model as it currently exists, which is precisely what, what I wanted to come on to, mm. um, like, as you say, pretty much, this is the common pattern across the combined authorities, um, 
a lot of your funding, or most of your funding, comes from direct grants for one thing and another from central government. You have the sort of 30-year investment fund, which is more flexible, um, although even that is you know, subject to review and so on. But, but mostly the projects you run, are, here's funding for skills, here's funding for housing, here's funding That's through fine. the Shared Prosperity Fund, whatever else it is, um, compared to, say, Scotland or Wales, where there's a block grant with a lot more flexibility and, and, and long-term certainty around it. So that's something the government has recognised is a problem. Michael Gove has said there's too many separate funding streams. It doesn't provide for that kind of accountability, as you say. Um, and there's a commitment to, well, fixing it, streamlining the funding landscape is, is the phrase. So is that now happening? Are you um, engaged in, in negotiations about reforms, I mean, you said you've been talking about it for a few years, but particularly in the context of levelling up, since the government's now kind of more openly says said it wants to fix the system. It is absolutely something uh, we're talking to government about. Um, I actually quite like working with Neil O'Brien, right. um, the levelling up minister. Um, yeah. There's um, Neil from a policy background, so he's someone you can actually get into the detail with. Frequently, you'll talk to a minister and then you'll come up with a suggestion or think, I don't understand the implications of it, I'll go and talk to someone else where Neil gets it. So uh, he's got some very productive discussions. So we'll, we'll see what comes out because ultimately it needs Treasury to sign off on anything anyway. That is always the block. Um, and by the way, every domestic department will tell you that as well. It's not just me. Absolutely, they will. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, it goes right down from the competitive bidding, some of which is a basket case. I'm um, quite happy to be quoted on that. Um, so if you think about something like the Community Renewal Fund, we were told uh, last year that this fund would occur um, and the bids had to be in, in June and we would find out in July. But all the money had to be sent, spent by the 31st of March. So I was talking to people, my team were talking to people, we were saying, look, Jamie, we're not going to bid for this. I can't suddenly get a quarter of a million quid. Hire people. By the time I've recruited them, I've got two months, and then I'm going to lay them off. Mm. We're not going to do that to our organisation. It, it just makes us totally unstable. We actually ended up finding out in October what had been allocated, and it had to be spent by the end of this year. It's a crazy way of doing it, and it gives nobody any stability, so you can't do long-term planning. The blight of governance in this country is short-term planning. Mm. If we could plan long-term, you could have genuine innov innovation. So you can go to the other end of it, our £20 million a year core funding, um, so that we do have pretty much unlimited control of. Um, subject to one or two minor legal uh, requirements. Then you've got things like the Brownfield Housing Fund, 24 million, which has now actually been upgraded to around 32 million. But that's more delegated than devolved mm. because not only have they said, build some houses in Brownfield areas, great. They've also said, you must meet these criteria on benefit cost ratio uh, and various other criteria in there. So you're really limited in how you can bring these things together. Mm. Because it is the case that if you could do something about supply chain in the building industry, you could do something about skills, you can therefore do something about life outcomes for people. But when it's a, you must spend this money in this way at this time, you're not able to bring in those extra benefits, those positive externalities mm. that you want to see. So that's the argument for better devolution. If they just said, that crack on with it, you achieve a better financial outcome for the government and a better life outcomes for your people, I don't really care how you do it, and you'll get more money if you do it well. Mm. That is the holy grail of devolution. And by the way, it's the only way a modern economy can work. It's far too complex to try and command and control from the centre. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And so, yeah, the Community Renewal Fund, that was one we were, we were following mm. um, as it was yeah, delayed and delayed. And then, as you say, the, the, the timelines on that were a bit ridiculous. <laughs> is the Shared Prosperity Fund a better model then in terms of how that's being managed and the, the way funding is allocated through you? It's a better model. Um, uh, the quantum of money is far less than was promised. That's more of a political point. Um, at the time, you know, a lot of people point out that 350 million quid on the side of a bus um, didn't stack up with reality. Mm. Um, so what we've lost in a region like ours compared to the, the previous European money is much less. To be fair, the mechanism is much better. Mm. Um, I know people who literally handed back European money because it was so onerous in the restrictions placed on it in terms of reporting. Um, so it is better. Um, there's a lot of expectation management. There just isn't the same amount of money that there was. 
but it does give us that freedom to work and get those reinforcing things. It's, when, when I'm perhaps talking in a, a less informed audience than this, I tend to refer to it as the penguin principle, that idea. You look at penguins on all the nature documentaries, they're all huddling together, and the warmth of one penguin supports the other penguin. So it's what we can do in terms of job creation can support skills. What we do in terms of skills can then make transport links more viable because mm. people are using them. And better transport links helps people's life outcomes and creates housing uh, and makes those projects more viable, and which in turn creates more jobs. And it's really that, that reinforcing benefit of projects. That's what we want from devolution. Mm, mm. The Shared Prosperity Fund model will allow us to do some of that. Okay. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on then to what we've skirted around and, and, and referenced a couple of times, which is the, the prospects for a larger um, devolution deal. So, um, I mean, this is <laughs> familiar to no, no, all the local people in, in the room, um, but, yeah, just, just to be clear for uh, those not so familiar with the local geography, the three areas to the, in the north um, are the North of Tyne combined authority area. Yeah, so the two red bits there, Newcastle and North Tyne side, and then the big more rural um, county of, of, of Northumberland. The three to the south were originally due to be part of the uh, Northeast Devo deal back in 2015-16 that then, yeah, fell apart. So. The negotiations now, or the idea now, is there'll be some kind of expansion, um, probably not to all of that, because County Durham is seeking its own um, county deal, at least that's my understanding. Whether that's still an open question, you can maybe tell us. So <laughs> first question is, where are we up, where are we up to in that process, um, and, and what should we expect going forward? Uh, negotiations are active. We've come together as um, what we refer to as the LA6, so it's all the red bits and the blue bit, um, where myself and the local authority leaders got together and said, look, is, is there a future in this? Uh, it's something I started as soon as I was elected, mm. uh, uh, talking to people. Because some of the people in the South said, look, we didn't want this last time, we're not going to talk about it again. Um, some of them from the beginning... In the said, South, you mean? This, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the South, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not like uh, <laughs> you know, the... the the foreign land of Manchester and Leeds. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we started those discussions. And they've been going for a long time because when you're talking about something as significant as coming into a combined authority, um, people want to be reassured and they have to bring their people with them, their groups, um, their electorates, their, their residents. Um, and so you can't necessarily rush people. And I'm always never one for railroading people because you need people to to want to not only be in it, but to mm. contribute to it actively, which has worked spectacularly well in the north of time, despite political differences. The links are very strong, we collaborate. It's not a case that we come together and just divvy up money. We actively involve those local authority officers in the development of the projects. Mm. We go out work with the businesses, we work with the, the community and voluntary sector, and they're key delivery agents. So if you're gonna do this right, you do need not just um, consent, you need uh, enthusiastic participation. So, uh, the discussions have been going on for some time. Um, I first started discussing this with ministers going back about 20 months ago, where myself and all the leaders came together. Then we're in and out of different lockdowns and other priorities got in the way. Long story short, the most recent meeting we all had was with Neil O'Brien, uh, where we agreed a way forward. We agreed certain things that are red lines from our side, uh, around which there was actually unanimity, which is always great. Um, what are those? And they are the size of the investment fund, and uh, no unfunded liabilities, and the disaggregation of metro transport. So I'll come back to that last one. But currently, we have a, an investment fund of £20 million pounds a year, mm -hmm. which is frittering away rapidly with inflation, as is everybody's. So, uh, nevertheless. So... What the North of Time wouldn't, wouldn't accept, and indeed people in the South were, were fully supportive of this, is less per capita per person. Having been elected for the North of Time, I can't say, yes, I'll, I'll accept a, a lower deal for the people I represent. Um, and all of our councils uh, were supportive of that. Um, so those discussions are active. I'm speaking to the um, Chief Secretary of the Treasury this afternoon 
um, about that again. Mm -hmm. um, so um, obviously because of my role, I tend to speak to the ministers perhaps more than some of the others, but it is a definitely a collaborative process. Um, so that's one of them. Um, the second one is no unfunded liabilities. Uh, well, that's, that just makes sense. Um, there would obviously be a massive temptation for central government to say, and by the way, you're responsible for this, but you can't have any money for it, just raise taxes on people locally. It just doesn't work for us. Uh, the business rates base in the northeast is £300 per capita. In London, it's £940 per capita. The idea that we can send, tell fund this just doesn't work, and so mm -hmm. it's off the table. Mm -hmm. um, I've not raised the mayoral precept. I've no intention of doing that. Uh, in places like Newcastle and Gateshead, you've got 25% of people on council tax support already. It just doesn't work. Um, so no unfunded liabilities. The third one is the Tyne and Weir metro system. Now, that is 36 stations north of the river, Ta -da. 24 <laughs> south of the river, and you can count them. Um, <laughs> Most other conurbations, Liverpool, Manchester, London, the South East, um, have a very large proportion of their commuters move around on network rail, on heavy rail systems. Very few people do in our part of the world because we built the Metro 40 odd years ago and it's a terrifically high value for money system and it works beautifully and I use it um, all the time. However, network rail is guaranteed a central government funding stream. And if there is a major problem, a tunnel collapses, central government is responsible for it. Here, this is owned by us. So what I wanted, um, and everybody else uh, was in the same position, is when they're giving us the transport money, that we're not expected to fund something which everywhere else is funded nationally. So what we call that is disaggregation of metro funding. So that was one of the, the, the red lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the officials have been working through that. I spoke to Grant Shapps about it on um, Monday. Um, and he's, yep, I, I perfectly understand the argument, um, and I will, I will help you in discussions with Treasury. Treasury. So have you put uh, a specific figure on that then? Um, well, that's a matter for negotiation, so I don't want to give some things out because they might be wrong tomorrow, might be wrong. <laughs> it, there's backwards and forwards. Understood. So, um, I don't want to put something out there that's um, just going to be wrong in a week's time. Okay, yeah, okay, that's great. Well, yeah, that's... Uh, the, 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 the slide I was coming to anyway, just to show that mm -hmm. this, this is one of the reasons, of course, why, it, as, as mentioned before, it's definitely felt like an incomplete Devo deal. It doesn't really make sense to have the, um, the, well, the, the metro system split you between... You can't change the governance of a train mind. as it crosses the river. Right, yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, and so, 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 so from, from your perspective and um, the, all the other local leaders involved, um, is transport the real big prize um, in these negotiations? Because, I mean, you talked a bit already about the, the funding. So just one other thing we had prepared yeah. earlier, um, per capita public spending on transport per region, that's the northeast. So obviously it's, it's quite uh, towards the, the low end of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, as, as usual, you have London at the other end, but also significantly Scotland <laughs> uh, with, with much more um, generous funding for, for, for transport and other bits of the country as well. So yeah, so where, where, when you look at the, what you're trying to get out of it, you've given us a flavour of that already, but is, is transport really the heart of it or are there other big things you're trying to secure as well more generally? You're quite right. Transport is a massive component of it. Um, so although I wouldn't like to give it an exact figure, we're talking of the order of hundreds of millions of pounds over the current uh, period. That's the five-year, what's called the, the Crusts money, the City Regional Sustainable Transport Settlement. Uh, hundreds of millions over that five-year period mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with a commitment to it being ongoing and not a one-off. So that, that's enough to make a big difference, mm -hmm. really is. Um, other things are that I'm very keen for us to get um, stronger control of our uh, skills, budgets and control. Mm -hmm. So where Beyond the beyond post-19 19 adult education yeah. budget. So yeah. we have, broadly speaking, around about a quarter of, of that is devolved and there, there, there are other aspects that aren't. Right, right. Apprenticeships and so on. Um, so where West Midlands and Greater Manchester are working on their trailblazer deal, um, would very much like to follow in at the same time. If they can have it, we're having it. Why not? We're going through a new deal. Let us do it. Um, we've done terrifically well with our adult education devolved budget. We got it devolved on the 1st of August 2020. Imagine a worse time. You know, we've just come out of one lockdown. Suddenly we've got um, eat out to help out. Oh, we're back into lockdown later. Um, are we allowed to open colleges? Are we not allowed to open colleges? Everybody's working out how to use Zoom mm -hmm. and, and realising they're on mute all the time. Um, <laughs> how, how on earth do you get 
skill. Can you teach a chef over the internet? I don't think you can. So there's all of that. Despite that, we increased enrolments by 10%. I think that's a phenomenal achievement. And we did that because we could work with the supplier base in a way that you can't by remote control from Whitehall. No reflection on the people working there. It's simply structurally impossible. So what my team did is would engage directly with people. Right? How can you do this? How can we flex the funding coming to you so that we can change the original terms of engagement that you were supposed to provide so we can give you the flexibility you need so you can come up with the bright idea, the people on the ground, of how to fix this problem. That's why we're able to do so well. So greater devolution results in better outcomes. Mm. You get more bang for your buck. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's obviously the idea. And I think certainly as far as uh, adult education budget and, and skill systems con concerned, um, government seems to, to, to recognise the value of devolution as something certainly on the table for any of the new Devo deals that might be struck, which is the last question I want to put to you before I'll then come to questions from others, so people in the room included. So um, we've talked about various things in the levelling up strategy and white paper. Um, one of them is further devolution deals. Um, so here's a, a, another map we, 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 we've um, prepared earlier. So the blue areas are where they're currently some form of devolution deal and they vary, vary in, in various respects. Um, the pink bits are where uh, negotiations are underway or due to get underway about, about new deals. Um, so including obviously the, the, the northeast area we've been talking about and various other places. So my question for you on that is the government is very keen that as many of those places as possible adopt the mayoral model, whether that's a combined authority mayor or county council mayoral leadership or, or something, but they very much like the single point of accountability, it seems. It's less popular, fair to say, among lots of people in, uh, in, in local government, not necessarily in this region, I'm just saying generally. Um, what's your view? What would be your advice to these pink places, so to speak, or even others, um, as they engage with, with white, or should they bite the bullet and, and go for the mayoral model, do you think? Would, would that be to their benefit? I, I'm always very hesitant to give people advice about something when they know more about it than I do. Um, so the whole point of devolution is people know what works for their areas. Uh, so my advice would be work out what you actually want to do with it because you'll produce a better case to government and you will get a stronger negotiated deal. If anyone going in to, to talk to Treasury on the basis of an if you build it, they will come argument, you know, well, give us this and we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll do some good things with it, you're not going to get very far. Go to them and say, if you give us it, this is our broad plan. We want to do this. Mm. We want to improve light outcomes. We want a better transport system. And you will see a return of X extra hundreds of millions of pounds over this period of time. That's a sound negotiation strategy. And you know what? I'm sure everybody has worked that out for themselves and don't need me to tell them it. When you talk about do local authorities and combined authorities work together, I can speak for hours, um, and I think we've got at least one of my cabinet members in the room um, who I'm confident will back me up on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, frequently, people say, you know what, it works terrifically well. Because there's two aspects to a mayoral combined authority. One is the mayoral, which is the single point of contact. Someone who can actually text the government minister, which local authority leaders rarely can. Someone who can uh, answer that Kissinger question. If I want to come to the North East, who do I pick up the phone to? That's the mayoral advantage. The other side is the combined. It's not a layer of government. It's a, a working together with all of our partners. Uh, who are equals in this process. Mm. Um, and that allows us to do things like we're reopening the railway line that goes from Ashington through by, through North Tyneside into Newcastle. It goes through all three of our constituent authorities. Now, yeah, fair enough, you could open a, a railway line without the involvement of the local authorities, possibly. What you couldn't do is get the housing sites unlocked, the industrial land unlocked, without that being seen as a cohesive project. Mm. And so that ability to come together and combine and bring everybody in works. And my, my piece of advice on anybody bringing combined authorities together, and some of them are counties where it wouldn't significantly change, mm. but if you're bringing different combined authorities together, it is work together 
to decide uh, what you're going to do. Uh, get your officers working together because, you know, all of our residents, they, when they drive from Wall's End into Newcastle on the metro, they don't notice that point where they're in a different local authority and they don't want somebody saying different rules apply here mm. if you're a local business and things like that. Mm. So that harmonisation on that natural travel to work area yeah. is what we should have. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's, that's obviously the idea of expanding the deal so you will more... Mm. Uh, better, you will better align with the, with the functional economic area that, that you're part of. Um, okay, terrific. Well, I'm going to um, turn to questions now. So I will start with a few that have been submitted online. Thanks for those. We have 20 minutes uh, or so. Um, okay, so here's one that's been submitted anonymously, um, which I, th I might put a couple to you together so we can take more, actually. So this is one um, where I know you'll have strong views. So would you uh, support radical action to solve the climate crisis? I'm sure the answer is going to be yes. But specifically, like, per mile vehicle charging um, instead of v fuel du duty to reduce emissions. Um, so that's one specific question. Um, and then here's one um, to go back to transport spending. Um, so if you had access, if you get access through, through, through the expansion of the deal to the sustainable, the crust, I guess, as you called it, the, the, the city regional sustainable transport settlement, what specific projects um, would you spend it on? Um, and maybe I'll take one more, which is also about the green agenda from also someone anonymous. How can the green agenda promote jobs for the lower paid? There seems to be many uh, jobs for higher, highly technical skills, um, but less for lower skilled people um, that might help them to upskill too. Okay, there you go, three, three, three for you. Right, thank you. Um, and a number of them reinforce each other. Yeah. Uh, so, um, radical action on the climate agenda. I, I, don't think there's anything actually more serious than this. Um, I look at the IPCC reports, I read the science on it. Um, I've got a technical background. Um, and I'm firmly of the opinion that we have missed the opportunity to prevent radical climate change. Uh, that's not to say that, it, that it's therefore too late to do anything because there are degrees of, of bad, um, literally degrees in, in uh, climate temperature. Um, but we need to be thinking about mitigation mm. as much as we need to be thinking about prevention. So when we talk about um, things like per mile charging, um, yeah, there's some merit in those solutions. Obviously, they would have to be national solutions anyway. The issue is that people still want to move around. What is the alternative we give them? And most transport questions in the public debate focus around um, changing the fuel, not changing the question of are we moving vehicles or are we moving people? Typical car weighs 1,500 kilos. Typical person weighs 75 kilos. Why do we take a vehicle that weighs 20 times more than the person, park it somewhere where it's not used for over 90% of its lifespan, is there as a massive depreciating asset? It just doesn't stack up either thermodynamically or financially. Where, now, I represent rural Northumberland as well. That is, individual transport is gonna be in, inevitably very different from people who live and work inside a city. But we need a system. This, this perhaps speaks to the second question on what would we do with the crusts money. Mm. Um, on that, there is a, a green transport plan. It's a very good transport plan. I was one of the people involved in shaping that because that uh, covers the south of the region as well. Um, and I would like us to, to get to a position where we have mobility as a service, where on one of these things, um, you have an app that's ubiquitous. You don't have one for this bus company, one for that bus company, one for the metro. You just have one app integrated with Google's technology that says, I wanna, I'm there and I want to go there. Mm -hmm. What's your options? Right, you can get this bus, you can get that metro. If you take your car, you can park in there, book your parking space in advance. This is how much it's going to cost you. And the app will do all the paying and give you the, the lowest possible mm -hmm. price. They're properly integrating all the yeah. different transport options. So we get to rock up transport. Because a lot of the reasons people won't use public transport is because it's complicated, there are none for buses coming. Anyone who's got a train 
is baffled by the ticket complexity. I don't care how skilled you are, you can be a, a, a certified chartered accountant. Um, working out rail tickets is damn near impossible. And, you know, we all just say, all right, uh, I've got to travel a day and I didn't know in advance, I accept I'm going to get fleeced. That's not the way it should be. So that's the, the approach that we should be doing with the City Regional Tangible Transport Settlement. If we get land value uplift, we can then do things like closing the Weir side loop, where on that map previously, from South Hilton, we take it through Washington, a massive town, which has no connection to the either heavy or light rail system, bring it back in to uh, the metro system. We can reopen the Leem side line, increase mm -hmm. capacity on the East Coast Main Line, so that we can get to Manchester and Leeds, uh, and particularly people in Sunderland South Tyneside. They're not necessarily going to go into Newcastle and then get the train down to Leeds and then the last mile solutions down there. They just drive. Where if we improve the public transport, mm -hmm. we will. So that's how we address the climate agenda. That's how we get economic uplift. It's how we open up communities who are, who are sometimes cut off from opportunities and are deterred from inward investment because the transport links aren't good enough. So that's how we fit those things together. On something like retrofit, when we're talking about radical solutions to the climate, there's about 24% of emissions are from, from housing stock. Um, and it's not only is it terribly bad for the climate, it's damn expensive, and, and that is, you know, we're seeing it with fuel prices. It is pushing people into serious poverty as a result of it. Um, and when you put your fire on, put the heating on, what they're doing is they're heating up outside as much as they're heating up inside. But, and we commissioned a piece of work, and this were all ready for when the funding comes, there are real constraints that if the funding comes in a big glut, the supply chain isn't there, the skilled people aren't there. What, one of the things that we should do is give mayoral combined authorities um, the power to regulate private landlords and with you know, fair criteria, go around and say, right, that property is, is class E on wasting heat at the moment, and it could be class B if you did this with a boiler, this with a double glazing, this with the walls. And in order to continue to function as a private landlord, you must fix this, but we'll give you the money. Mm. But you give us it back with a charge on the property for when the property is eventually sold. Mm. So the property is more valuable, it's mm. better for people to live in, their health outcomes are better because they're not living in damp, cold properties. Mm. It saves a fortune for the NHS. And that's again this thing about financial devolution yeah. closing the loops. Now, is that radical or not? I don't know, to me it sounds sensible. But they're the things that will really make a difference. And that would allow us to build up the skills pipeline and the supply chain. Mm. And you might have different, is that where you're implying different, say, council tax bans depending on? Well, not necessarily with council tax bans. It's, you know, some houses that uh, were built you know, in the 1890s have single skin brick walls. You are never going to get that to a class A. But there are some things you could do with that property that would improve it. So you would have it be more, almost a, a surveyor's question about mm. what is reasonable other than knocking down the thing and starting again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was just thinking about how you could use tax powers to incentivize people to, to I mean, you, if you, as you were saying, you could just say to landlord, you're not allowed to let, let this out, which is one solution, yeah. but, or you could use the tax system to. And to some landlords do it. Some landlords look it. after the property as well. There's a lot of landlords yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's a case, case of a level playing field. Mm. You know, at the moment you're disincentivized from doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, understood. Okay, terrific, okay. Um, Let's uh, take some questions from the room. So anyone who wants to engage, please stick your hand up. So we have one there. Um, yeah, gentleman behind. Anybody else? We can take maybe three together. Um, yes, OK, and one in the front. And then hopefully we'll have time for a few more. Hi, I'm John Goddard. I used to be Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Newcastle University. I know you work quite closely with the universities, and you talked about flexing the funding. Universities are major anchor institutions in their cities and get a lot of money from different parts of government. Do you see, perhaps in this discussion with your fellow mayors, uh, persuading the government to try and flex the funding so they can make the challenges we've been talking about, the skills system, um, the physical and, and transport, using the universities as partners to get a more flexible form of funding from the bottom up. And they're major users from the health service, all departments of white, yet the white paper on levelling up doesn't even mention universities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Directly I'll behind. My question. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, obviously, I do have time if anyone's issue. meanwhile formulated a question. Can fit it in. Otherwise, yeah, we'll just take this one. Thanks. Hi, um, if Labour was in in charge of the of the country, 
how would that affect your plans? Okay, and yeah, we have one more question at the back, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I mentioned before I was very keen to hear about your thoughts on what Labour's agenda for this should be. Hi, yes. you've talked a bit about the opportunity around decarbonising homes, so um, I'm, I'm going to be preaching to the converted here, obviously subscribe to that. I just wondered about your, you know, you've got the devolved budget around adult education and what more can be done with your convening powers mm. to help solve this skills gap and also help build the supply chain because at the moment the issue is how do we fund it but also we just haven't got the people to deliver it and we don't have the supply chain there to deliver it so I suppose it's what more could you do yeah. to help drive that. Mm -hmm. And so do you want to just say who you are? Sorry, Tracy Harrison, Chief Executive of Northern Housing Consortium. Hi Tracy. Um, oh, do you want to take one more? I'm sitting, yeah, right there, let's. Thank you, slightly different. I'm Simin Davoudi, I'm co-director of Cities um, Centre for Researching Cities. Um, I want to go to planning. In terms of getting more devolved power, would you consider having a strategic spatial planning for the devolved areas? Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah, interesting one. Controversial in, in several of the places where there are, uh, there is a role for the Metro Mayor. Okay, so, so four, four questions for you there. Yeah, okay. Um, funding and flexibility. You know what, actually, a, a number of these might not seem to be related, but they are. The, I would suspect, I have no evidence for this, but it's my intuition that the reason universities aren't mentioned in the levelling up white paper is because it's a de departmental issue. And a fundamental problem with the governance of Britain is silos. Departments, although they, are, it's not true that they don't talk to each other, I know they do, but they will not step on each other's toes. Um, and you can kind of understand why. What I, you're showing some of those places on the, the map earlier. If you asked me about Devon, I couldn't tell you a damn thing about it, you know, um, in terms of what's really happening on the ground. I could tell you the big towns. Um, so I couldn't have an informed opinion. And when you've got to talk, if imagine it's the Department of Education, you've got universities and adult skills and schools and, and, and so many other things, and national curriculum and teacher training. And, and then are they going to talk about research and development, which is a Bayes issue? And phew, no, they're not actually. Uh, never mind, start to intervene in the levelling up debate. And given that that levelling up white paper was 350 pages long, it's the size of a telephone book. I've got a paper copy. Um, you can well understand why they didn't put anything else in it. Um, so the issue here is the need to be joined up at the point where someone can actually do something about it. There is a natural level of devolution. Mm. And it's not all at the city region mayor level, by the way. Some things work much, much better at the local authority level. Emptying the bins. If anybody tries to offer me the power to empty the bins, I will say no. Uh, as you said, I was a bike councillor and half of the questions I got were about emptying the bins. Um, some things, of course, should never be devolved. Um, foreign policy, national defense. Um, and there are those things largely of an economic transport skills level that work at the level of the functional economic area. Mm. And so things should sit at the right level. And some things should be below local authority level as well, by the way, um, you know, on a, on a community basis. Yeah. If it's a, one of the, the reasonably sensible, we'll see how it pans out, is if there's a, a planning thing, well, let the people who live there who are affected by it make the decision, as well as how it affects the rest of the city. Which feeds into, should we have a strategic spatial plan? Um, that obviously has a, a specific... Um, legal meaning at the moment, but the broader sense of should we be deciding as a, as a city region, uh, including uh, large parts of our region, which aren't a city, it's rural, we go all the way up to Berwick. Um, yes, there should be planning, but should that involve everybody deciding now what's going to happen and, and how much flexibility should there be in it? That's where these things usually come unstuck. And it takes years and it takes a lot of time and energy to get there. I would suggest a useful interim would be to give better planning powers to Merrill Development Corporations, MDCs. Uh, particularly, everybody is aware of, of stalled sites where there were former factories or lead mines or what they might be. That they're expensive and complex. Mm. Or other areas where land assembly is particularly difficult. Um, and if you were to give the power to a mayoral development corporation where the mayor in a quasi-judicial way says on a compulsory purchase order, um, yes, that stacks up, I want to do it. 
And if people don't like it and it meets the threshold for appeal, it goes straight to the Secretary of State rather than being mired in legal delays for years, which mm. the only people who do well out of that are the lawyers, honestly. Nobody does well out of it. Every time I speak to a developer, what they say is, I just want a quick decision, yes or no. I don't want to be waiting for five years because I've lined up the, the funding and it's, it's, you know, people are going to go elsewhere. So the Secretary of State can then say yes or no. Then we could really get some of these sites unlocked. Um, and that includes you know, controversial transport decisions as well, possibly should mm. be looked at that way. Um, so that's where we should be on, on planning. And on the skills part of it, um, which actually the previous question, what should we do about low paid jobs? Are people missing out? One example, for example, is we're working very closely with British Vault. Um, uh, was talking to their chief operating officer and he was saying that, look, we have a difficulty here. We wanted to send people down to the, the only place we can currently train them is down in the West Midlands. People with families, are they really going to go and spend months down there training when they've got the kids? Well, no, they're probably not. So we won't be able to recruit those people uh, mm. into uh, better paid jobs than, uh, than they have now. And half the people we'll send will stay there. Um, you know, if they are single and they'll make friends or they'll be offered other jobs, it just doesn't work for us. So what we're doing is we're working with them to see can we solve their skills problem, building the skills training infrastructure here, and that's physical and sort of supply chain provider skills here, working with Envision, working with British Vault. Mm. That's the, the answer to it, um, so that people can get those jobs. Um, and we've, we've got a, actually a pretty good track record in a lot of that already in what we're doing with carers returning for work, people in social housing, so that they can improve their incomes. Um, you know, that, that's number one to it. All backed by our um, good work pledge, which now covers 40,000 people in the north of time. Mm. And that, that guarantees the real living wage. The difference between the minimum wage and the real living wage is 40 quid a week, 2,000 pound a year. Now, if you're a low paid worker, that is life changing. Um, you know, I would like wages much higher for everybody, but you know, with that. And you're just trying to persuade employers to, to, to sign up for that pledge. You don't actually have any power, obviously, to, to make anyone. We pay have a convening role in that. Right. Um, it's in their interests to do that because it badges them as a good employer and makes them more competitive in recruiting people. Mm. But we do actually include it in our contracts okay. where we're dealing with people on a commercial basis. So if an inward investor comes in, we want to create some jobs, great, we'd love to have you here. You have to look after the people you recruit. And anyone who says, I don't want to do that, isn't the sort of employee we need anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there was a question about labour. What should yes. the labour answer to, well, position on all this be? Um, we, I think it Presumably was, everything you've been saying for the last hour. Uh, what, what difference would it make, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the other man yeah. and I were talking to Kia last uh, Thursday, we were all together in Leeds, and you might have saw that very cheesy photo of us all on the bus. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to do these things, part of the job. Um, and it was very much what I was talking about, and I've had previous discussions with Rachel Reeves and Lisa and Andy about this, about fiscal devolution. Mm. Because frankly, until you give us the financial tools to close the loop, it's only ever going to be better delivery, which we can do. But we don't want better delivery. You can't level up from Whitehall. It has to be driven from the places where it's going to happen. And that requires the people on the ground to be making the decisions. Uh, collaboratively, as we do, with our local authorities, with the businesses, with the, the community and voluntary sector. Mm. And it works, and it's make a difference. We can, we can point to our track record, you know, that ability to create jobs four and a half times faster than government had predicted. Um, so that's some of it. Um, and um, what Labour's position is on this is... Um, obviously there's a lot of people with different views on it so there's the commission that Gordon Brown's been looking at um, and uh, I'm speaking to Gordon later this afternoon with the other mayors mm. and I hope to know what Labour's position is on it um, so I can tell you what my position is and all the other mayors <laughs> we all agree with each other obviously as you expect um, and I would hope uh, that the Labour Party nationally gets this one of the things mm. Keir did say he says look you're all in power one of the things that to get back into power Labour needs to convince people is of course we, we're a safe pair of hands with the economy. Mm. And you look at the track record of Labour in power in the mayors and it's superb. You know, we can clearly demonstrate that we're good at this and all the myths about Labour isn't good with business, Labour just wants to raise taxes. It's just not true. Yeah. You, you said you're talking to Gordon Brown to mm. find out what Labour's position is. I assume Keir Starmer still gets to decide in the end. Uh, well, or not? <laughs> yeah, if you want to get the, the technicalities of, of Labour's position, it would come to the Clause 5 meeting when they decide the next manifesto uh, okay. before the next election. So. Right, there you go. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, we're almost out of time, I'm afraid. There's quite a few others. I don't know if we can squeeze in a really quick one or two just before we close. So one is on policing. Um, so if you do ex get the expanded deal, would you potentially take on the PCC role as some of the Metro mayors have? 
And uh, well, maybe that's sufficient part of the question. Um, and then the other one, possibly there's barely time to touch upon a big subject. But one of the big issues I know the government's trying to improve is stronger accountability and scrutiny processes for mayors, uh, which we've been looking at at the IFG as well. Um, what, how would you strengthen mayoral scrutiny or scrutiny within the mm. combined authority as it expands? Uh, uh, policing, um, all right, keeping this brief, um, uh, it may be that the Home Office say, you have it or the deal's off. So it may not be our decision. Um, well, we may be over a barrel on that. You know, that's one of the issues of central government. Um, the reality is operational policing is still with operational police officers. It's not with PCC, yeah. it's not with mayors where they have it anyway. So what difference can you really do as a mayor with, peace, with police and crime powers? Probably very little. Um, the primary determinants of this are um, a, a social, our well-being and, and these things. So you can do something about that as the mayor. Um, but the, the things in the criminal justice system, uh, probation, um, helping people avoid recidivism when they come out of prison, mm. police and crime commissions, you don't get that power anyway. You're largely, you're on the hook for raising the council tax. I mean, that's actually really what PCCs mm. unfortunately have to do. And the precept sack, that then you can, just gets you, passed yeah, on to the police exactly. operation. And you can, you can sack the chief constable. That's a bit of a nuclear option, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know um, so, um, would we be able to do much difference with it? Not unless we had a much stronger model, which I would advocate for, um, were it to uh, come to me anyway. Um, oh, in terms of accountability and scrutiny, you know, this is a funny one, isn't it? That people think that because you have a direct mandate, you're somehow not accountable. You're way more accountable. Um, MPs or councillors can get rid of a council leader or the prime minister. Only the electorate can get rid of me. But only f every four or five years. Well, that's the same as any electoral cycle. But, as I mentioned earlier, real accountability doesn't come from league tables. It comes from delivering results. So if the finance is related to did we deliver, there is no better method of accountability. In terms of scrutiny, we are the most scrutinised politicians there is. Um, we have all of our cabinet members have their own scrutiny. Um, our chair of overview and scrutiny is here today. Um, we meet um, uh, frequently and talk about what's happening. We have the overview and scrutiny model. We have a five-year gateway review with mm. uh, central government. Um, and um, all of our cabinet meetings are in public and, and live streamed. Uh, everything's available. Mm. And of course, I do mayoral question times um, all the time. So, so you um, don't think there's a need for any strengthening of any of that? Um, not for scrutiny, um, really not. Because scrutiny is about can we shine a light on this, do we know what's happening? Yeah. Everything's out in the open, there's, there's really no issue there. Yeah. Um, accountability is a separate one. Is, accountability is basically, if you make a mess of it, how do we get rid of you? Well, A, you're directly accountable, but B, real accountability doesn't come from messing about with the league tables, it comes from, um, did you deliver? Because mm. actually one of the other questions was on this topic as well. Should there be some kind of recall mechanism for mayors who don't perhaps meet targets or uh, perform to a certain level? Yeah. Because obviously um, there is that for MPs now, for, well, for a, certain misconduct anyway. A big issue in um, politics at the moment is what do you do with senior politicians who break the law, for example? Um, well, yeah, it's quite topical, but we're yeah. down that route now. Um, and I, the, the Good Law Society recommended getting away from this really arcane misconduct in public office, which is damn near impossible to prove. Um, and it should, we should have a charge of corruption in public office. If you are uh, guilty of, uh, you can demonstrate that, that you've somehow been spending money legally, oof, out you go. At the moment, you have to go through um, very complicated criminal procedures from that. Um, so certainly there should be a strengthening of the law um, for those politicians. And, and it's still always a minority of politicians, by of the way. Of course, absolutely. Politicians of every party are usually very hardworking, very diligent, might disagree with each other, they might have different levels of competence, but very, very few of them are as dodgy as the news would make out. Same with footballers and actors and all of these people. You know, we, we, we tend to see the, the snapshot of what makes a headline rather than the reality of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that's definitely taken us slightly over time, so uh, apologies to anyone who had to be away exactly at two. Um, but thanks so much. That's been a really interesting conversation. Hopefully, um, really uh, a good watch as well. But I've, I've learned a lot just from talking to you. So, so thanks for that. Um, thanks again to our partners here at the University of Newcastle, Kurds, and the Centre for Researching Cities. Um, just to advert that 
On the 21st of June, we will be in Manchester for a similar event with um, Andy Burnham. Um, so please do sign up for that. Um, and we, the research team at the IFG, are working on a report on the Metro Mayor model, which will be published at around that time as well. So please look out for that as well. Um, so that's all from today's IFG event live in Newcastle. Um, anyone in the room, please do join us for tea and coffee afterwards. Obviously, those online, uh, that doesn't work for you, but hope you can all join us again. So thank you. Didn't put the kettle on at home. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you very much.